Engineers. The engineers are here. Seems like we should be writing on graph paper. So let's write on graph paper. Sharing the screen. Awesome. All right, are you guys there? I see you, sort of. I see Landon, Halia, and Eveld. Are there any humans? Yeah. Humans are there, okay. So, <clears throat> I want to show you something conceptual about what we were doing the other day about distributed loads and kind of why it works. Um, so let me just show you something kind of cool, kind of simple. And it also pertains to what we're going to move into. So let's see, let's do this. <laughs> So let's consider this. If you have a so you had kind of a beam like this, and over here is weight number one, and over here is weight number two, sort of say pounds that are coming down. And what we'd like to do is try to find this thing called X bar, which is the center of mass, center of mass. Or in the language of what we were just discussing the other day, really it's kind of the, well, where are all these forces? Where are all these forces concentrated? Um, center of mass is just where something acts. In other words, if there's, I, I just have two weights here, but you know, a distributed load has hundreds of them. But what we did the other day was try to reduce all of those weights of which there were many into one location. And so that X bar is kind of the, the location. The center of mass is the location of that single force. Do you understand that? The location of the single force. Replacing all the others, of which there are millions. So that's what's powerful about the center of mass. As we said before, in the end, that's what's kind of so cool. So if I if I picked up this lamp here, for instance, and I threw it across the yard, and it started, you know, it's going to spin because I'm not going to be able to throw it like a knuckleball. It's probably going to spin some. Does it make sense that, you know, no matter how complicated the shape is, like this weird coffee cup, there's a center of mass in this somewhere. And if it spun as it flew through the air, it's going to be rotating around the center of mass. Um, that's where it acts. And so we can treat the coffee cup like a particle, as long as we can locate that one location where that center of mass actually goes. And, and that's what we were doing the other day is replacing that with different forces. And so so let me show you the kind of the intuition about this. It's kind of cool. And so what we're going to do is, well, I'm going to even just to convince you, if you will, that you can kind of be anywhere. If I went over to here and I said the distance to that first, I'll call this point O. If the distance to that first one is some distance x1, and then of course I'm going to repeat that process, the distance to the next one out there is going to be x2. Watch what happens if we, I don't know, effectively kind of create the, 
the sum of the moments. If I kind of come up with the sum of the moments around, well, think, think balance here. Um, let me see, can I write it this way? It's... X bar minus X one. So does this make sense to you? If this is going to balance, and again, what we're thinking of this is, is almost like a teeter-totter. Like you have one kid, weight one over there, and he's further away, and you have the other kid, W2, and it's not as far away. And so in order for this to work, this W2 weight would have to be heavier because it's got a shorter distance. So you got a force times the distance, and then a force over here times the distance. So does this make sense? If I say, well, that weight number one times its distance. How far is it away from x, x bar? And in a sense, x bar is really this location, like where is that located? So this distance right here, kind of distance one, would be x bar minus x1. Do you agree with that? In other words, that's its distance. So effectively, that's calculating that distance one right there. And then this distance two over here, would you agree that that distance two would actually be x2 minus x bar. And that's weight two. So this is kind of collectively distance two. So if those two moments or torques were equal, if they were equal, then wouldn't this balance? And hence, x bar would be the center of mass. or the place where those forces are located, if you will. The balancing point, I guess you could say. Well, let's take, let's take this equation up here and solve it for x bar. Let's solve it for x bar. Let's solve and find out where is this x bar that we speak of. We're trying to find it, so let's solve for it. Well, if I multiplied out the left side, I'd have W1 times the X bar distance minus W1 times X1. On the other side, I'd have W2 times X2 minus W2 times X bar again. And if I want to solve for X bar, I've got to get all the X bars on the same side. So this one's already over here, but I'd have to add the W2 X bar to the other side. So now it's over there with the other one. And I want the non X bars on the other side. So I'll add that W1 X1. I'll add that to the other side. So then if I take X bar out, factor it out, I have weight one plus weight two equals the same thing we had before. And so you could say that X bar is found. How do you find X bar? You take w1x1 plus w2x2 and you divide it by w1 plus w2. Isn't that what we did the other day? I don't know if I saved that note. I probably threw it away. But isn't that what we did the other day? In other words, stare at what we just made right there. We, the intuition of this is, isn't this really the sum of the moments? Isn't that a force times the distance? Every one of those is a force times the distance. And notice it doesn't actually matter where you measured from. I just picked some random point out in the middle of nowhere. Like you could, I could put that point anywhere. That O point, if you will, I could have put it any place I wanted. But the end result is what you're really doing is adding up all the moments and then you add up all of the weights or all of the forces. And if you divide those, isn't that what we did the other day? Isn't that how you found? Isn't that how you found where that one where that one single force was actually focused? And of course, we would say, you know, that the sum of those moments is actually an integral because it's not it's not a Riemann sum where there's a finite number of them. Now, just now, I just had two. That's a Riemann sum. You added two of them together. But if you have infinitely many of them, then you just have to change that to an integral, and you're kind of on your way. That's going to give you that 
single location. That's what, that's what we said the other day. So I was just kind of just kind of building some of your your intuition. So that's kind of neat. I mean, it's not it's not kind of obvious that that would be the case. Um, we saw that in one way the other day, and now I'm just kind of showing you this way. That's just kind of an interesting way to conceptualize this. So cool. Well, let's 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 go let's go do a little of this. Let me pick up a, another couple of examples. Let's see, let's do 451 first. So notice this has a couple of different triangular loads on it. And, and because it's got two different triangular loads, you actually have to do two separate problems here. So do you see the kilonewtons up there as forces? Those are the forces that we need to add them all up. That was kind of what was on the bottom of our formula. Notice it says, replace the loading by a single resultant force and specify the location measured from point O. In other words, what is the force and where is it? That's what I'd like to know. What is the force and where is it? So let's see if we can figure that out. What's the force? Well, I do have to divide this into two chunks. And so let's, let's do that. I'll kind of, maybe I'll just color this chunk over here orange. So we said the other day, just because that's not as complicated of a, a formula, like I, I could find the equation of the line there, but because that's a triangle, we, we figured out the other day, since it's a triangle, I can just do this as an area problem. In other words, that orange area would be the average of zero on the left plus six kilonewtons on the right. Notice it's kilonewtons per meter. So it's the average of those two. So I'm gonna write that here, that's kilonewtons per meter. And then if I multiply that by the fact that that is 7.5 meters long, isn't that cool that the meters cancel? So I end up with three times 7.5, which is 22.5, I think. That's 22.5 kilonewtons of force. So there's one of our forces. And, I, and as I said, I have to separate this into two parts. That other triangle is a totally different animal. And where did we say that was the other day? Tuesday. Where's that located? If I, I just took a billion forces right there and I added them all up. Two-thirds of the way in. Yeah, two-thirds of the way in. So if I divide 7.5 7 by three, you get 2.5, so another 2.5, that'd be five. So it's like here-ish. And I'll even kind of write that in there. That's a distance of five, because that's two thirds of the way in. My 22 kilonewtons is right there. So I was able to do that without integration. Do you see what I mean by that? I didn't have to do an integral there. But I find myself quickly thinking, hmm, I wonder if I could do an integral there. Well, let's try it really quick. What's the equation of this line right here? Well, its slope is a rise of six and its run is 7.5. And notice those are totally different units. It has a rise of six kilonewtons per meter and a run of 7.5 meters, six divided by 7.5 is 0.8. So that's eight tenths or four fifths. So this is equal to four fifths for the slope. And so would you agree the equation for that line then would be y equals four fifths x, or as we said the other day, maybe a better way to say that is w. What would the units be? Let me think here. Let's see that six kilonewtons per meter 
six kilonewtons per meter divided by meters. That doesn't make the meters cancel. Do you notice that? That's six kilonewtons or four fifths kilonewtons per square meter, I guess you could say now. But then I'm multiplying it by X, which is a distance. X is some random distance in here to, to whatever hap slice I happen to be paying attention to. So X is a meter, X is meters. And so the collective four fifths times X is actually back to kilonewtons per meter. And notice it starts at zero here. So I could say plus zero, but that's actually the equation. And so I just want to see, could I get this same answer? Could I get the same answer by adding up the sum of the forces? Again, do you understand the concept here? I'm I'm saying, well, that's a little bit of X. I'm sort of taking that little area right there. That little width is a little bit of X and the height is, well, W. So now if I say, all right, what's the integral of 4 fifths X times DX? And X is working its way all the way from 7.5 to zero. Let's see, that would be 4 fifths x squared, but then I'd be dividing by 2. There's already a 5 down here, so that'd become a 10. And so then I evaluate that at 7.5 and it's 0. So what is 7.5 squared times 4 tenths? Oh my goodness, it's 22.5. That's unbelievable. Kilonewtons. So just to track with this, again, that unit right there is kilonewtons per meter. And then I multiplied it by X, whose units is meters. So I actually am adding up a bunch of kilonewtons. And so I found the area under that shape. But again, you say, well, why would I need to do that? It's a triangle. I don't need, I don't need to use calculus to find the area of a triangle. No, you don't. That's why we just did it with a, with a triangle a second ago with a formula. But we're about to do a problem, as I showed you the other day, that's got a curve in it. And so, you know, if, if, the, if the change in force is not growing linearly, like this one is, this change of force is growing linearly. If that change was going parabolically or something like that, the cool thing is now you're actually going to need an integral. So it's kind of cool to think that, you know, all this studying you've done in calculus last year actually does turn into something kind of useful, powerful. So there's that sum of the forces. Now let's go over and figure out these, I guess we'll call them the purple ones. Let's do that really quick. So again, that's pretty easy. So I've got the average of six and zero again, divided by two, that's why I'm taking the average, but that's only over a distance of 4.5 meters. So I get kind of a much different answer, a much smaller answer. So 4.5 times three is 13.5 kilonewtons. And similarly, that one's also going to be two thirds of the way in. So if I throw this arrowhead in here and say that's 13.5 kilonewtons, and I know that's two thirds of the way in from the short side or one third of the way in from the long side. So that is conveniently three meters in from the right hand side. So, so do you, are you, this is the big takeaway from what we're talking about in chapter four right now, 4.9 is, I just took a billion forces and reduced them to two. That's pretty cool. And then notice they threw a couple of other things on there that are just kind of from nowhere. Like, you know, hey, look, there's 15 kilonewtons from nowhere, just sitting right over there. Cool. And there's even a moment over here on the other side. There's like a moment somehow magically applied to that shape. So to get the location, I need the sum of the forces. It's not going to work. Actually, I think I'll write it with integrals. The sum of the moments divided by the sum of the forces. 
and now I know all the forces. I know there's 22.5 and 13.5 and then that 15 over there. So I know what the sum of the forces is. That's kind of cool. So sum of the forces is 22.5 plus 13.5 plus that mysterious 15. What does all that add up to? That's 22.5 plus 13.5. I must be feeling lazy today. I can't even add that in my head. I get 51. So that's 51 kilonewtons. And it is going down. Maybe I should throw a negative in front of that. Maybe I should throw an arrow over here just telling myself or everybody else, oh, that's going down by the way. But now I need the sum of the moments. Well, does it make sense I can, I can get that now just by the fact that I know that those, I know those forces, I know where they are. So let's go find the moments. So let's see, let's find the sum of the moments around point O. And, and notice I actually have to choose point O. Why can't I choose other points? Does anybody know? That's not an obvious question, I don't think. Well, we're already uh, given a moment there, so I think. Say that again, Ben. Because uh, we're only given the moment moment there so if we choose another place we wouldn't know what the moment um yeah we wouldn't be able to use that piece of information yeah that 500 is is be, we're being told that 500 is around point oh so we have to use point oh because it's not 500 anywhere um now having said that that is a propeller so maybe actually i'm rethinking what i just said maybe we could go anywhere maybe we could put this in the middle like where these both are some where they run into each other and that would still be 500, I gotta think about that, but oh, it makes the most sense. So, okay, well, cool. That 500 is rotating clockwise, so that's negative. I guess I'll throw that in there. And then I've got that 22, which is also negative, and it's at a distance of five. And again, I'm paying attention. It's kilonewtons and meters every time, even though I'm not adding those units to this. They told me that 500 was kilonewton meters, and I just multiplied 22 kilonewtons times five meters, so everything's cool. And then everything's going the wrong way. And 13.5 here is multiplied by, well, I can't say three because that's not the distance from that side. So that's 12, it's actually nine, right? Is that nine? Nine meters. And then I've got 15 also negatively all and it's all 12, since the whole distance across there is 12. <clears throat> so that's what's acting on it. Notice again, I, I'm, not, I'm not using this to find the reactions. I could, I could go back and say, I could add in, you know, plus and then put this reaction force of this other joint over here, this other I guess it's a joint. I could add that in here and make it equal to zero, but I'm just kind of trying to see, see what the sum of all the moments are. This thing badly is wanting to rotate every single part of this, wants it to rotate downwards or you know clockwise over there. So if I punch all that in, I get 914. Would the second term be 22.5 times five? Thank you. Wait, is this one? Yeah, I never. I looked up here and I wrote 22 and not 22.5. Thank you, man. Nine fourteen is still correct because I didn't write it wrong before. I just did this earlier. So, so that's kilonewton meters. Uh, do we need to put a negative 914? Yeah, I got to do something to say what that is. So that would be either, you know, draw an arrow showing that you're going clockwise, write the word clockwise, call it negative. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. I'm actually going to draw an arrow since that's what I did earlier. So 
I now, I'm going to write this over here. The sum of the forces is equal to 51 kilonewtons down. And let's move this sort of final statement down here. Now we're kind of ready to get the, the third part of this, which is the, the location. So I need the sum of the forces. I need the sum of the moments. I found those without using calculus effectively, although we did go back and use calculus. So So if I divide kilonewton meters by kilonewtons, does it make sense my answer comes out in meters, which is good because this is supposed to be finding a distance, right? So this, because of the way I calculated this, this is going to be the distance from point O, since that's the point around which I rotated everything. So if I take 914, and to Evold's point, this is technically negative 914 and technically negative 51, right? So it's a negative divided by a negative. So 914 divided by 51 comes out 17.92. So basically what this means, well, you tell me, what does that mean? I'm sitting here with this bunch of forces plus this force plus this 500 rotation. And here's point O. And so what is that collectively? I mean, all those complicated forces and two sets of infinite forces and then that one 15 kilonewton standalone force and then that one standalone 500 newton meter rotation and what does that all reduce to it reduces to 17 point oops wrong it reduces to our sum of our forces 51 kilonewtons out here but notice where it is like it's not even in the graph. Do you see what I'm saying? The whole thing was 12 meters long and it's way the heck out here. So it's not even on the shape itself. So we have effectively reduced all of that complexity to just one force in one location. We kind of found, if you will, the center of mass, like where that thing is actually trying to behave. And it's not the center of mass, it's more the it's more the, uh, in this case, the you know, simplification of all these forces into one force. And now we know where it's located. <clears throat> so effectively, that's our final answer. If I relook at the question, it said replace the loading by a single resultant force, 51, and specify its location measured from point O. 17.9. It's too complicated to have all of these forces. I just need one force and then I can talk about defeating it. And again, remember, that's what we were doing in the last section. We defeated that force by, by just coming back here and, and you know calculating the reaction at that other point over there. So it's not like we're just going to let this rotate. We're going to make it static, but the point is, is by reducing it to just one force like this in one location, we could make it static. I'm going to erase this, but does it make sense if I called this point over here? Well, I'm going to erase it, but if that's C, that other point, that point over there, wouldn't it be true then that 51 times 17.92, which is sending it negatively plus the reaction at A times a distance of 12. Wouldn't that have to be zero? I mean, that's what we're doing. And that's the whole point of this. And so I could use that. The reason I did this is so that I could make it static. So this problem is just oddly not asking me to finish.
interrupt and ask questions if you don't feel good about that. Yeah, I'm not feeling good about this. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm still not getting how's the um, like a, a one force can be off the, the bridge. I should say it's not on a bridge. Yeah. Um, good, that's a good question. It's, it's just collectively all of those forces pushing down very badly want that shape to rotate. Now, the thing that's bothering you is, is that there's kind of nothing pushing back. And so if we did finish that calculation for the reaction at point A over there, then we'd have something pushing back up and it would sort of feel like it was okay again. Um, it's, I mean, I think what's bothering you, well, what's, what's bothering you is that 500 over there, frankly, it's the 500 that caused that, that caused that to move out off of the shape. Because 500 newtons is a lot of a lot is a pretty big number. Do you notice in these other calculations we just did right here? 22 times five. 20 times five is 100. So that's only 100. This is nine times you know roughly 13. That's like 100. And this right here is like I don't know 12 times five is 60. That's like 180. All of these put together are actually less than that 500 is right there. So that 500 is making a huge contribution. It's making as much desire to rotate as all three of the other ones combined. And that's what's pushing it out there so far. So, so basically, is the bridge need to get redesigned? No, it needs, it needs it needs this joint here. In other words, if that joint right there, if this joint's not there, then then it needs to get redesigned. So what, what's bothering you is you're, you're thinking, if you just collect all of these forces right here, it seems like they're like all inside the shape, right? So why wouldn't the single force be inside there somewhere? Like you're, you're okay with a 13.5, right? Like it's in the middle of that purple area somewhere. It's not, you know, it's not exactly in the middle, but it's in there somewhere. That makes perfect sense. So if we uh, tried to counteract that force, it'd have to obviously be um, bigger than uh, 900, right? Because it would have to be closer in to get that same moment. That's exactly right. So that mm -hmm. force a day is going to be humongous and it's thanks to the 500 that it's going to be so huge. And then that would even be like, I would be bigger force than the other force. So we'd kind of have to put another one going down to counteract that. Yeah, actually I'm kind of curious about that myself. Why don't we finish that calculation just to, just for the fun of it. So if this is point a over here, then that's find the reaction today. So let me just rewrite, rewrote, rewrite what I wrote earlier. So the sum of the moments around O, considering everything, considering we're trying to get this to be static. So I can simplify my calculation by just saying the force of 51 times the distance of 17.92, that's negative, plus the reaction force at A, which is at a distance of 12 pushing up. Now the whole thing is going to be equal to zero because I can't let this thing just go spinning and falling. So 51 times 17.92 equals divided by 12 equals a reaction force at A of 76.16 or 76.2 kilonewtons. That actually should bother you. That should bother you. Let me draw it down here. The reason that should bother you is how much was pushing down? Even though it was kind of way out here, well, only 51. So how can that be more? Doesn't it seem like it'd have to be less than 51? Isn't that what always happened before? It was like I was gonna get two numbers if I went over here to point O. Uh, because maybe most of the forces are closer to the A. 
Well, like, I mean, big forces, because if we're going to go more to the left, mm -hmm. the force is getting smaller. Yeah, I guess for this to necessarily work, um, there'd have to be some force going downward at O. Like but what, given what the joint is, that wouldn't really work. Does it make sense that that force at A actually has to be negative then, so that the sum of the forces in Y is zero? What? How can that possibly be happening? Can you explain that? Have to be going down with that much force of up. So basically, that side's going to lift up off the ground. <laughs> That's what it's saying. In other words, that O point is actually going to jump up in the air. And I think this is what Landon was getting at in the sense that do you notice that that force over there, that support just seems to be a roller ball support? Like there, it's not actually connected, which means there's nothing stopping that from lifting up in the air. But that 500 again is such a huge number trying to propel our shape, trying to spin it like a propeller that it's actually lifting it up in the, up in the air on the other side. So we would need to anchor that in such a way as to hold it down. This is not going to stay static based on what this drawing shows. Now their problem was just, we took it further than what they just said. But that means there's a problem in the design and you can kind of see why why that's the case. Now when I draw house plans a lot, I get I get trusses and they'll sometimes have some uplift on one of the sides. I won't take you in to show you that, but I, most of the time those two forces are just going to be downwards and in, in what we've seen happen before happened, which is these two reactions down here are both going to collectively add up to 51 and they're just going to be pushing up and everything is fine. But based on wind load and some other com complexities, sometimes there's so much force on one side or if something is cantilevered out that it'll actually try to lift the other side up. And, and they're telling me that because I got to go strap that down. You can't just set it there. Most trusses, you can just kind of set them there because the only force they're providing is just an upward push. But you can appreciate if you had a beam that that looked like this and you said, I'm going to support it right here and I'm going to support it right here that if you put weight out here of people or whatever, then you better tie that thing down on this left side or it's definitely going to lift up in the air. You see what I mean? Like that would actually have a negative force over there. So I can see it here a little more easily. The problem we just did is super, it, it's very not intuitive, but it's because that 500 is causing more rotational desire than any of the other three things combined. So the main point, reducing complexity, that's it. Let's take a look at a, another question. Same exact question. Except notice, although there are infinitely many distributed forces now, they're not producing a triangular shape. They're producing like a parabolic shape. And fortunately for us, they told us the equation because we're not going to find the area under that curve there by using geometry formulas. So yesterday we used Tuesday, we used rectangles. We said, I know the area of a rectangle. It's length times width. I'll just multiply them. I know the area of a triangle. It's length times height. Cut it in half. I don't know the area into that shape without calculus. So it's pretty cool that they gave us an equation for that. Now, I find myself thinking as a much more practical person, first of all, how would you ever get a load like that? And number two, if you did, how would you come up with an equation for a parabola? Because you'd have to come up with that for yourself. Does that make sense? But I will give you one, one opinion right here, just quickly. Let's say you poured some concrete like this and you filled it full of rebar so it was pretty stiff. And then you put it on the ground. But then you put, and the reason you did that is so that you could put heavy stuff on here. So let's say you put this engine or something like that sitting on there. Can, what do you think that would do to the ground if you put that, if you put that engine on there? If 
that concrete was stiff, like it bent nothing, it wouldn't bend, it would not bend at all. It's just so stiff and strong that it didn't bend at all. Would you agree that that load that it put underneath it would be equal all the way down? So I drew all those arrowheads the same length. But if that concrete bent, which it's going to do, because you can't make it perfectly stiff, or even if it was a piece of steel, like isn't that going to bend it down in the center a little bit, kind of put a curve into it? It seems to me, and I, I would say I don't have a, a ton of practical experience here, that as a result of this, I'd get the biggest kind of bends in the center, and then it would get lesser and lesser at the outside edge. The question is, what is that shape? Is it a triangle? Is it linearly deflecting like that? Or is it actually, you know, bending maybe like this? Kind of in a parabola shape, perhaps? Or maybe the parabola is going the other direction. Actually, I don't think that's it. That's not true. It's going to be continuous. I think it might, it might actually bend in that fashion, if that makes sense to you. So that could create a shape like that. Maybe that's what causes it. Um, textbooks typically don't care. They just, they're just contriving up some kind of a question for us to solve. And it's like, who cares where the force is or where it comes from? But it'd be fun to see that in real life. Cause I don't, I can't, I just gave you my theory, my working theory, but I'm still kind of working on this. Um, there is one thing that's very interesting here though. So, so first of all, I kind of want to test this out a little bit. Um, like what is the weight, what is the weight at X equals zero? Like they gave us that equation up there. I noticed they actually have a W axis right here and an X axis. Like that axis is not where I would have thought it would be. I would have thought it was over there at A. Mm -hmm. But the weight at location zero, in other words, the length of that force right there, notice we're in pounds, so we feel a little bit more at home, would be two times zero squared minus eight times zero plus 18. So it's 18. Does that look reasonable in this picture? Yeah, it does because there's 18 over there and that looks to be about the same size to me. So I think that's probably true. And notice in the middle at two feet, what's the weight two feet in? Um, I know the answer to that, it's 10. They're telling me it's 10 right there. Let's see if that's really true. Two times two squared minus eight times two plus 18. That's, what is that, eight? Minus 16 is negative eight plus 18, sure enough is 10. So I'm a little curious as to why they told me that. Like, why did they tell me these numbers up here? Do I need to know those? Notice that 28 is at negative one. What's the weight at negative one? That'd be two times negative one squared minus eight times negative one plus 18. That'd be two plus eight, which is 10, plus 18, sure enough, 28. Little side note, we won't go down this rabbit trail, but would you agree negative one, 28, and two, 10, and four, 18, are three ordered pairs that they gave us here? Do you, could you write three equations, three unknowns for that and use a matrix and actually create this equation for yourself? You should be able to. In other words, if this was not given and you just took your own measurements, you put your motor up there or whatever the heck you put up there and you just took measurements, like you put a scale underneath point A and it measured 28 pounds and you put a scale under three feet and it measured 10 pounds and you put a scale under B and it measured 18 pounds, could you say, hey, that's weird, that's creating kind of a curve. 
hmm, maybe that's a parabola. Now, again, I find myself in the real world thinking, how do you know that's a parabola? Maybe it's a circle. I'd need to collect some more data to kind of figure that out. But, it, but it's kind of interesting to think about something that would cause a curved loading pattern like this, isn't it? I wish I had more experience because I'd like to actually know the answer to that. So the matrix, the matrix would actually produce that equation. I would encourage you on your own time to go see if you can pull that off. Remember, the equation would be y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And when x is negative 1, y has got to be 28. When x is 2, y has got to be 10. You're going to end up with three equations, three unknowns there with an a, b, and a, c in them. And then you solve for a, b, and c. And apparently, you're going to get 2, negative 8, and 18 since they gave us that equation. But that's speaking the language of math. And that's powerful if you can do that. That's really cool. Anyway. What do I need to do? This is actually easier than the previous problem because I have this equation. I need to find the sum of the forces. Sum of the forces is the integral of, and again, can you see why this integral is working? This W right here is really W as a function of X and X is this distance. So if this is our little slice we're looking at right there, W is the height of that slice. And that height in this case is not a distance, it's a weight in pounds per foot. So that unit is very important. So the height of my rectangle is W and the width of my rectangle is a tiny bit of X. If I multiply those together, then I'm adding up all those rectangles underneath that curve. That's really cool. So that would be the integral of 2x squared minus 8x plus 18 dx. The integral of x squared is x cubed. And then I divide by 3. The integral of x is x squared. And then I divide by 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4. And the integral of 18 is 18x. And so now I throw in my, well, what do I throw in? What are the limits of integration that I left off here? What is, where does this, what, for what X's does this exist? A one to four, right? Yeah, good job. It's all the way. And again, notice I got to see that weird axis they threw in there. I don't know why they'd throw it in in such a weird place. I, I would have thrown it in at A or something like that. But that's exactly right. It'd be from four to negative one. So thanks to them putting that in, it, it, it could have been from five to zero had they put the axis over there at A and then zero would have been much easier. So now I get to throw four in there and, and I only have to calculate this myself. Um, if you don't screw that up, you get 73 and a third. And as a reminder, what what's an engineer going to do if, the, if this ever comes up? How's an engineer going to calculate that? I had most of you for calculus last year. What are you going to do with that? You're not going to take an integral of that. You're going to let a machine do it because it's dangerous. <laughs> like I'm about to build a bridge here. I can't afford to get this wrong. And it's even if I'm awesome at integrals, I still can make stupid mistakes. And so they're just going to type that in their graphing calculator, put that into Desmos and ask it what the area under that curve is. So again, that's really interesting to think about. There's infinitely many forces there that work their way from 28 to 10 to 18. And if I was to add them all up, they add up to 73 and a third pounds. Isn't that cool and also kind of surprising? So let me ask you a question I bet you don't know the answer to. Conceptual question. Watch this. If that left one is 28 pounds, would you agree this one right here looks like, I don't know, maybe 22 pounds and this one, maybe that's 20 pounds. I mean, if I stop right there, 20 plus 22 plus 20, plus 10 plus 18, I'm already way over 73. How can, how can that be 73?
Well, look, just looking at the chart, those aren't one feet, those those aren't one feet apart. Looks like a quarter foot. So it'd be a quarter of twenty eight plus a quarter of twenty two plus a quarter of twenty to approximate that. Nice job, Landon. <clears throat> this distance right here is a foot, and notice that twenty eight is twenty eight pounds a foot. And so that's really a quarter of a foot that I just went. And so 28 is really divided by four and 22 is really divided by four. 20 is divided by four. And so that's why we're multiplying by DX. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not just a quarter though. If we want this to be really correct, we can't just multiply it by a quarter of a foot. We've got to multiply it by a teeny amount of feet. So 28 is actually being multiplied by not a quarter, not an eighth, not a 20th, but like a one one hundredth. I mean, it's super tiny. You're adding up infinitely many, infinitely small things. So it's just cool to think. It's cool to reason. Impressive catch, Landon. OK, cool. Now I just need my sum of my moments, which is easy. Because a moment is a force times a distance. Moment. So that means I just have to take this force that I just calculated and multiply it by a distance of x. So this would be the sum of the moments around it. Well, I guess, yeah, around, we'll write that down in just a minute, times dx. So collectively, I'd like to write this in another way. If I write w times dx, that's really the force, and then the distance is actually x. In other words, it takes w, which is in pounds per foot, to be multiplied by feet, dx is feet, in order to get pounds. So w is pounds per foot, not pounds. So for us, that just means, okay, easy. That's from four to one. I need to take my equation, 2x squared, and multiply it by x. That means every one of these is going to get another x to go with what it already had. So I'll be taking the integral of that statement. I'll cut to the chase and tell you that that is 89 and 1 sixth foot pounds. Notice in this problem, unlike the last one, there's no any exterior weirdness here. There's no just magical 500 foot pounds of moment just kind of added from nowhere. And there's no individual random heavy forces coming from nowhere. Last time we had 15 kilonewtons just pushing down on it from nowhere. Here we're actually seeing all the forces. Every one of them is kind of in front of our eyes. So the distance again is the sum of the moments. Sorry, that was four to negative one. The sum of the moments divided by the sum of the forces. So that's 89 point, what is one sixth? One six, 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 I think. Divided by 73.33, you get approximately 1.22 feet. So to Evold's point before, doesn't this feel a lot better than the last one because it because it's inside the shape where it ought to be, right? And it's because there's no 500 added to it that it's that it's inside there like it should be. So if this is the x-axis and this is the w-axis, and we have this interesting curve kind of coming in like this, then what we just figured out is if you went over 1.22 feet, since it was 2 to the center, 1.22 was you know, a little closer to over to here. That's where our 73 and a third pounds is acting. And it's positive 1.22 feet. So 
So there, there were a billion forces and they were very complicated. Now there's only one. <clears throat> We won't do this, but now that you have that one force, does it make sense it wouldn't be very hard to go back and find the reactions at A and B? Does it make sense that'd be really easy now? So again, I think the book problems are a little bit, it's fine that they're asking us to do this, but I, I think if you don't stop to think like, why do I wanna know that? because it would be extremely important to know those reactions at A and B to make sure this whole thing can be static. Because right now it's not only not static, but it's also wanting to rotate around that random origin here. It's wanting to rotate negatively thanks to 73 pounds pushing to the right of it. So it's wanting to rotate that way very badly and it's wanting to go down and so it's force A and force B that are going to fix all of that, right? They're going to fix the moment. So it doesn't want to spin right now. It wants to propeller and fall. So force A, force B, those reactions are going to stop the propeller and they're going to stop the fall. Any two numbers for force A and force B that add to 73 will stop it falling. Do you understand that? If I make this 10 and this 63, it's not going to fall now. Do you agree with that? but it's gonna not fall, but it's gonna spin like a propeller. Maybe this way, I'm not sure which way I have to calculate it, but it's gonna spin. <clears throat> that's, that's what equilibrium is all about. No spinning, no translating. So that's why I've got to do with some of the moments of calculation to kind of see how much of that 73 goes to each location to counteract its desire to rotate clockwise. Does that feel good to you guys? Have we done that enough that you're kind of like, that's cool, I get that now. This is going to be a really good test question. Yeah, and in my mind, I, mean, I think you can see now <clears throat> where this where this is going. I mean, in the sense that like this, this is exactly what I showed you on those BC calc printouts that I, you know, that I use for designing beams is these reactions are really what I'm after. I don't really care how much weight is up on that beam. All I care about is the beam doesn't sink into the ground. And so the fact that that sheet actually, that program actually calculates these reactions for me automatically is really cool because I, I might screw up. I mean, all I gotta do is push a button once wrong and then the house starts to sink into the ground and you know that I'm out of business or whatever. If you can deeply understand that, then you get the concept of kind of what what statics is about. In, in one respect, I want to say this one problem now is, is the sum, sum total of everything we've learned in this class that, that you really want to take away. I can feel good about. Um, as I said, I don't really understand that parabolic loading because that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen very often. I've seen a ton of triangular loadings and rectangular loadings. That's what I usually see because um, floors are calculated to have, well, the same force all the way across them. A floor has 50 pounds a square foot across it. That's that's how you, a residential floor on a house, you calculate it to hold 50 pounds a square foot. And I don't know who figured that out, but it has to do with you know how many people would be packed in there and how much furniture would be in there and you know what's the most you could ever get in there. Now you can appreciate if you had a bunch of idiots, they could all stand like I weigh 180 pounds and I could probably stand on one square foot, couldn't I? So if we just pack the house full of people and you're in the middle like a penguin in the, in the polar ice cap and you're like all huddled together and you can't even move, like you could load a house in a way that it had more than 50 pounds a square foot on it. But that's weird. <laughs> people don't do that. So, you know, I don't know what do people what did they what did they do? Just have a room full of people and have a party and like just see how far people stood apart. You know, I think people weigh probably the most in a house more than furniture and stuff. So, I don't know, interesting. Mm. 
So again, go satisfy yourself. Go calculate that force A and force B because it just feels like we should not stop here. This is like the stopping in the middle of this problem. It's very wrong. Okay, what I want to do now, if there's any other cool things I need to show you. That. Okay, I want to show you one thing just to get a, a head start for next week on, and also because it's related. So we're not actually switching, we're switching gears here a little bit, but, but not a lot. Um, you would have dealt with this concept in, in calculus a little bit, actually. Um, but the concept of center of mass. So as I said before, like in order for us to make this coffee cup, behave statically, we have to figure out where its center of mass is. Does that make sense? Notice there's no arrows pointing at this. I don't, where does that come from? You know, where do you get a bunch of arrows? I just have the weight of this coffee cup and I could set it on a scale and I'd know its weight. But because of this handle over here and the fact that it has a bottom but the inside of it is hollow, does it make sense? It'd be kind of hard to locate exactly where that center mass is. Now it's really cool if you had a like a if you took a video of this and I just it's full of coffee so I can't do this but actually I can do it with this one. Does it make sense if I spin this thing that it's spinning around its center of mass? So if I could like watch it in slow motion and kind of highlight where that center of mass was, like you can actually find it experimentally, or perhaps I could just you know set it on this little balance right here and just keep moving it from side to side until it you know wants to balance. Pretty close to balancing right there. Does that surprise you? That doesn't seem like it's in the middle. Seems like it's a hair closer to the right, my right. So does it make sense you can do some kind of experimental things to find the center of mass? And that's great as long as it's a coffee cup, but what if it's a skyscraper? <laughs> you can't flip skyscrapers, you can't balance them on pins. You got to kind of know that stuff ahead of time. And so sometimes there's some mathematics associated with that. So let's just take a look at centroid is, and notice that little X bar that I showed you a little while ago. The X bar is the center of mass. And so if I have this shape right here, if I have some just random weird shape, and this is obviously not an engineering problem, I'd say the center of mass is about right there. That's the center of mass. And that is labeled with an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. So X bar is the center of mass with respect to X, and then Y bar is the center of mass with respect to Y. And so if this little piece of steel here will say, and notice it's pretty big, it's four meters by eight meters. Eight meters is 24 feet long. This is a big piece of steel, this thing's huge. And so it was pretty simple until somebody decided to cut a parabola out of it. Does that make sense? That's a pretty random thing to do, but they sort of, it was a rectangle and they chopped the parabola out of it for some ridiculous reason. And so we need to find the center of mass of it. And so it's, it's where's that gonna be? Because do you understand what, what causes this thing to have any force arrows on it at all is its weight. Does that make sense? So it's not, I, I'm not even putting anything on it. I'm not putting houses and stuff on top of this. I'm not putting an engine on top of it. That's not what's causing it. It's just its own weight. This thing's made out of steel. And so it wants to fall. And so I got to kind of know where that force is acting. You see how closely this is related? Um, you also might have wondered in this class why I've wandered all over the place in the book. But you see how close, this is actually chapter nine. We, we just left chapter 4.9 and now we're in chapter nine. And it's the same exact concept. Um, and again, I'm actually stealing that. I'm stealing that approach from the syllabus that OSU uses, actually. So then when I taught through it, I thought, oh, that's why they did that. That's pretty smart. I like that. OK, let's see if you can make sense of this. This is really beautiful. I'd like you to understand it. I mean, I can show you a formula and you'll get the formula right. The cool thing is, is it's exactly what we just did. X bar can be found, well, 
by the sum of the areas times, actually let me write it the other way, the sum of the areas times the distances. Does that make sense? That's what moment was, a force times the distance. But in this case, the force is related to the area. In other words, if you have a big area, that's heavy. If it's made out of steel, big area heavy. And then distance is, well, the distance, just like moment is force times distance, all divided by the sum of the areas. Like this is exactly what we just did. It's no different. Now, the thing that I think is not obvious about this is how this works. So if I take a slice out of this shape right there, would you agree that in the language of math, the width of that slice is a little bit of X since it's horizontal? And from calculus, one year ago, I'm teaching this exact same thing to the calculus class right now. How tall is that slice? Well, would you agree that it's four all the way up to here? And then isn't this distance the Y coordinate of that parabola? And so isn't that height right there then four minus the Y coordinate of my parabola? Isn't that the height of my rectangle? And that's the width of my rectangle. Like, isn't that how we found the area? Back in the day. So let's go get the area, which of course is that guy right there. So the area of this thing is the sum of all those rectangles added together. Well, what are all those rectangles? They're a width of four minus y. They're a, I'm sorry, they're a height of four minus y. They're a width of dx. And so I have y's and x's. Uh, that's disappointing. Well. Thankfully, we know y is equal to 4 minus 1 16th x squared. In other words, I can replace that y with what it is in x's. And now that I know that I'm working in x's, for what x values does this shape exist? Doesn't it exist from all the way here, all the way over to the right? So doesn't it exist from 0 to 8? Cool. So from 8 to 0 of 4 minus 4, it's gonna, this is going to be really nice. 4 minus 4, that actually goes away. And then it's minus a minus 1 16th. So actually, all I really have is 1 16th x squared dx. And even the 1 16th can pull out front. So I end up with 1 16th times x cubed over 3 evaluated at 8 and at 0, which comes out 64. So that's an area. So I guess it would be square meters. So there's my area, 64 square meters. That doesn't look right. because it's not. It's 10 and 2 thirds. Incidentally, the reason I just thought that didn't look right is I looked over here at the shape and I went, okay, that shape is 8 by 4, but then it's kind of like a triangle. Well, 8 times 4 is 32, and half of 32 is 16. And ultimately, this thing is curved upward, so it'd be less than 16. And I'm like, 64, how can that be 64? Do you do that? 
Do you stop to make sense of things? I'm always talking about that. I caught my own stupidity there. I'm just trying to save a little time because I already, I already calced that. So I just looked over at my notes and looked in the wrong spot. So I found its area. Well, now I need to find its moment. This is really cool. And this this should bother you, but what we what we learned at the start of class is the moment around which point. The answer is it doesn't matter which point. You can pick any point you want. So at the start of class, I put that little X bar there, and then I just pick some point off to the side that was nowhere in particular. So for moment, time to switch colors. For moment, which is that calculation, I'm going to find the moment around, and you're always going to want to do it this way, around, well, in this case, the y axis. Or maybe I should say from the y axis, because it's not really around. In other words, that little slice that I just put right there, I'm going to take that area, and I'm going to multiply it by how far away it is from the y-axis. I'm going to spin this thing around the y-axis, or I'm thinking of it as rotating around the y-axis. How badly does that want to rotate around the y-axis? Again, you can pick any point you want, but that's the easiest because x starts right there. In other words, that is x. So that's the distance to my slice. So the only, the only change in my calculation then is I say I want to go from 8 to 0. And I still have the same exact equation I had before, which ultimately simplified to 1 16th x squared. But I'm just going to multiply that by x now. So it's an area times a distance. So I end up with 1 16th. I have x cubed. If I take the integral of x cubed, I get x to the fourth over 4. And I stick in 8, and I stick in 0. And that's where I get 64. That would be 64 meter, or what was m? Yeah, meters. It'd be, well, actually, what would its units be? Because there wasn't any force here. Meters cubed, maybe, because we, we multiplied an area times a distance. We, multi we multiplied, yeah, that's exactly right. We multiplied an area, which was square meters, times a distance. And so that's going to be meters cubed. Nice job. So then if I divide these, I'm done. I'm going to jam this over in the corner. So then x bar is equal to the moment divided by the area, which works out to be exactly 6. That is a miracle of textbooks. And notice it's meters cubed divided by meters squared, which is actually 6 meters. Do you agree that that looks pretty darn reasonable if you look up at the picture? So again, I chose to measure from the y-axis. And so that answer I just got, 6 meters, is also measured from the y-axis. And so if it's 8 till the end of this thing, then 6 would put us about here. And that actually looks about right, doesn't it? Doesn't it look like there's about the same amount of shape left as there is right? So do you see how that found the x-coordinate? The x-coordinate 6.
Looks right. So all that remains is to redo this for Y. And we'll have just enough time to pull that off. Now, the cool thing is, does it make sense that Y bar would also be equal to, well, the same thing. It would be the sum of the areas. Well, wait, isn't it exactly the same thing? The area times the distance? Well, yeah, it is, except for this distance up here was the distance in X. In other words, how far was it from, it was kind of like the distance in X from the Y axis. This one down here is actually gonna be the distance in Y. So I don't have to recalculate the area again, all I need is the moment. So let's draw a picture of that so that you can see it in action. I already know that this is divided by 10 and two thirds, I already found the area. But what's the moment? Let's draw a picture of it. Copy that picture. I wish I could. So this time, though, we're going to do the moment from not the y axis, but the x axis. Oh, excuse me. So let me highlight those two things. I'm just interested if you can see the logic of this. So we went from the y axis before because each of our slices was vertical. And I guess I want, to under, I want to know if you understand why those slices had to be vertical. This time our slices are actually going to be horizontal. Why are the slices horizontal? Well, does it make sense that every single part of that chunk is a distance of y? from the y-axis. In other words, all of that metal is the same distance away. But if I move up a little bit up to here, now there's way more metal. So that's a bigger force and a bigger distance. And so that's why I've got to slice it horizontally because I'm trying to figure out how far this y-bar is from the x-axis. And so I've got to spin it around the x-axis in order to accomplish that. So that's why my slice needs to be, well, it's gotta be parallel to the axis I'm gonna slide it around. So I'm gonna have little teeny areas with little teeny distances, medium sized areas with medium distances, and then really big areas with big distances. And so that's why I've gotta kind of turn my slices the other direction. <clears throat> now I could turn the slices the other direction and recalculate the area, but I already know it's two and two thirds, so I don't have to redo it. But would you agree with the slice turn this direction that this rectangle of area here, its height is a little bit of y. And since this distance all the way out to here is eight, and this distance to right here is only x, does it make sense that this width is eight minus x this time? So there's my rectangle, it's eight minus x wide and dy tall, does that hurt in your brain? Again, please interrupt. I already know this stuff. If you're not tracking with this, or even if you just wanna say, hey, give me a second, let, let's think about that. I'm, I'm not tracking with that completely. Give me a second. So now we basically need to solve it for uh, our y equation for x. That's exactly right. So with respect to moment, I'm gonna say, okay, Cool, I just need to add up the areas times the distances. Well, our area is eight minus X times DY. Isn't that those rectangles? So there's my area. And how far is that away from the X axis? It's a distance of Y. So 
So everything here is Y. Awesome. Well, except for that X. Since everything is Y, then I know that this slice is going to slide from a Y is 4 to a Y of 0. So I'm going to use Y values for that slice to slide. And then I just got to switch out that X. So let's see if the equation was Y equals 4 minus 1 6 X squared. Y equals 4 minus 1 16 X squared. Let's see, I'd have to add, subtract 4 from both sides. Let's see, am I going to run out of room here? I'd like to do the algebra here. And so that would be y minus 4 equals negative 1 16th x squared. And I would multiply both sides by negative 16, which would make that positive 64 and 16y equals x squared. And so x is the square root of that. So then I'm going to throw in the square root of 64 minus 16y. That's what I'm going to throw in there for x. Do you agree with that? Woo! So everything is y now. So, I don't know, are you still good enough from calculus an entire year ago to still be able to take such a complicated integral? No. <laughs> the answer should be no. <laughs> but let me just remind you of something. Um, I'm gonna... Actually, let's do this a different way. So I'm just going to do it in Desmos because I Desmos is is easier for me to conceptualize. And also, I just would like to remind you this: engineers do not do calculus; they cheat. They're going to have some kind of a program to take care of this automatically. So, so watch this and and ask me this if you want to. You should be able to still do this in your graphing calculator. But I'm going to go over here to functions and over to miscellaneous, and there's integral. And we said we wanted to go from zero to four. I'm actually getting better at this every year. And then it was, let's see, it was eight. I think I'll start with a frenzy. It was eight minus that square root. And the square root was 64 minus 16y. I don't know. Um, 64 minus 16y. I'm wondering if it'll work with y's. Let's find out. I was thinking I should switch to x, but let's see if it'll work. 64 minus 16y, so that was the area, 8 minus x, that's the area, well, times dy. And then that had to get multiplied by y to become a moment. And notice it isn't doing it yet, and that's because it wants me to say dy, which I think is kind of interesting. It's like, is it really doing anything? Boom, there's the answer. That's not a terribly hard integral to take. Um, for those of you that are a little more mathematically minded, I'd, I'd encourage you to go try to do that again. See if you can get 29.87 like yourself. Don't, don't rely on technology. Can you still pull that off? As I said, I'm just that's a substitution problem. I'm teaching that right now to the other class. So 29.87. I think. Um, Yeah, I think I'll stick that in the notes. It'll just take a second. So you know how to do it in Desmos. So doesn't it make sense then to finish up that y bar would be equal to that moment, 29.87 approximately, divided by our area of 10 and 2 thirds, and I get 2.8.
approximately 2.8 meters. So let's look back at the original graph and see if we can agree that that actually looks mathematically precise. That looks beautiful, it looks right. Up 2.8. Why aren't you letting me zoom in machines? It's too complicated. Would you agree that that center of mass, I'm going to darken it into black. Would you agree that that center of mass at 6, 2.8 actually looks like that really would be about where it would be? Isn't there more area? I mean, this is a four over here, more area above that. So it's going to be above two. And the fact that it's almost three, like that, man, that's amazing. That actually looks right. So now I know where that thing is going to act. So if I knew how much it weighed now, I could say it's going to act right there. If it was a table, that's where I'd put the leg underneath it. If I spun it in the air, that's what it would spin around. No matter what direction it was spinning, it would rotate around that. It would act like a particle. That's, a, that's huge to know as an engineer reducing an entire building to a particle, so to speak, so that I can see how it's going to behave. So that's kind of a pre-kickoff. We're going we're gonna to talk about that more on Tuesday next week. We're just going to practice this some more and get a sense of it. But that's a good introduction to chapter nine. So we're over as usual, but about 1230 is what I expect to get done every day, and we're doing pretty good. Hurt your brain. One of the things I, for those of you that I had in calculus, that's exactly why I teach calculus the way that I do, because here we are needing it one year later. If your understanding of calculus was blind memorization, then you have nothing left. Um, you should have forgot a bunch of it. Like there should be all kinds of things you sort of can't do that you one time could do. As an integral, that's a that's not a hard integral right there to take if it was fresh in your mind. Um, but the question is, you know, can you play around? Can you conceptualize? Can you still draw pictures like this and conceptualize what area is? Um, the test I just gave that class, many of them bombed it because we're trying to find volumes of shapes rotated around. And it's like very hard to conceptualize that stuff. So being able to, I wouldn't expect you to be able to do what I just showed you without me teaching it to you, but, but are you able to follow it? I mean, are you able to kind of go, yeah, that makes sense. Area times the distance, I can see the logic in that. Hmm. All right, I'm going to post all of that stuff for you. And